end it. Okay. All right, I'll try and give the viewers a good view of the room. You guys go whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Ready, Marcus? I'm ready. All right, so uh, one small little topic, and then uh, a bigger topic, okay? Uh, the small little topic, we were talking last about that paper, about the, um, the free media orientation, and I just, well, I just wanted to share one little thought about it. it one of the ideas, I was trying to really get my head around it, and, and, and one of the things was how these, uh, how the orient, remember you had like on the rack on the surface of a cube, it's facing up, it's got its orientation cells, and, um, and then as it goes around the side, they change, they rotate, right? And it's like, it's kind of hard to keep track of what's going on, there's a lot of projections that. One way I thought about thinking about this, and this is my small topic, is imagine if I was in this room, and, and I was a rat, and, and I was trying to keep track of where the door was, okay? That's my goal. And because uh, I need to make an escape at any point in time. So I just always have a mental image of where the door is in my head. And now if I was facing here, I tell the door straight ahead. And if I start climbing up the wall, I see the door still over there. But if I move around the side, I say, oh no, the door's over there. So he went from like, oh, the quickest way to the door is, you know, so that I keep going in this direction until you, until you get the vertical and you kind of lose uh, any ability to slide. Uh, but you might still go forward. Uh, and uh, but but if I start moving around the side of things, it might might I just it's, it's sort of like that vector is like okay, it's just a way of sort of keeping in mind why would this switch if I do if I don't think about it as my orientation in the room, but just the, the direction I need to go to get to the door, then that's natural. It's just a natural way to think about it. It's coming around the door over there, no matter how we move, the door's over here. So it's just it's just flipping around a little bit to think about it slightly differently made it seem intuitive and more obvious that that's what should happen. Um, and if I just try to think of like the directions of the door as my orientation, then, then that's what it is. So anyway, that's a little topic there. And um, it just made that, what was a complicated description in that paper, and it sort of made it more sort of intuitively obvious. I can just give a thought on that. Uh, yeah, in, in, in that paper, they, they say something a little bit along those lines. I feel like that paper frames it that way. More it than, does? More, more than I Oh my God, I saw, that paper was like... I miss well, that. yeah, they, they talk about how it's it, how the head direction cells are doing their best to always point toward the door, or always. Yeah, the door. yeah, but they phrase it in terms of the azimuth and the yaw and the this and the that, and it's just like I don't know. I sure, think. yeah. But so, like for example, I mean, the door, the door head direction cell will be up uh, here when the rat's on top. It'll be here when the rat's on the side. Yeah. Uh, and then it's kind of strange when it's here. It's up yeah. Here to be I guess. I guess so. in my mind, the difference here was. It just to sort of been, maybe they said this, but in my mind, what the difference in my thing is, is just try to imagine it. The yeah. little thought experiment. Just try to be the rat and say which way is the door, yeah. and that answers the question, as opposed to what's my orientation. Um, I don't know, it, yeah, it's the same thing. I'm not saying it's any different. Uh, but then, really, the reason I stood up uh, is uh, because it all is applicable um, when the rat is in this half of orientation space. Yeah. Uh, when it's up, right side up, both if upside downness comes into this at all, then suddenly it's pointing the opposite direction. Well, I don't know why would that be the case. In my little, if I was imagining floating in space, and so I, there was no gravity, but I still had this cube in the room, and there's still a, and I can I can go all around this cube. So I'm floating in a big cubic space, and inside there's a little box. I'm I'm walking around through, and there's a door. Um, it seems to me it doesn't matter if I'm upside down or right side up. I would, by my intuitive logic, maybe it's not the same as in the paper. I would still have a sense for the door. So it goes on the underside of this object. I would, I would expect to get that way. Maybe, maybe then the update rules get very strange. Is the only thing. Like uh, as the rat like runs up this way, runs across this wall, runs down this wall, the same door direction cell is going to be active, right? Well, we're, no, I was thinking the door is in the background. Too. Okay, that's for sure. It's so that, if I'm going up here and here and here, the door is always to my right. Yeah, yeah. So the, in, in your example where the door is this way, um, the door is in front of the rat right now. That's, this is one of the a little bit indeterminate. It's like saying, well, there's really no shortest to sure. the door. It's sure. sort of diagonal to my body. Sure. So, so but, okay, right now, according to this setup, uh, this theory, the, um, the door in front cells will be active. The rat runs over over the top of the cube. Uh, that the, the door direction cells don't update. Yeah. Uh, uh, it runs down. They don't update. 
runs down underneath to the bottom. They have they to do it. Yeah, one, yeah. 180 yeah. degrees. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. just make a sudden change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if the rat um, instead sidles sideways from here, yeah. sidles down this, no head direction change happens. Yeah. Because it's still pointing at the door. Then it goes downward and still no head direction change happens. Oh, right. So wait, so he's facing this way. Yeah. And then he goes that way. Yeah, and then that's why. Yeah. So sometimes flipping upside down causes a one eighty degree change, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Well, I think I think that would make sense. It's sort of uh, uh, positions on this cube that are bistable or multiple stable. So you just it, there's really no answer which is the direction of the door when I'm on the face of the door going backwards. So it's basically, and I think they even said this like you just assume it keeps acting the same way, and that becomes really obvious if there's no gravity. You just like saying I'm just floating in space. There is no gravity. What should my direction cell be when I'm diagonal to the to the door in this location? And the answer is, well, anything is correct. So you might as well keep up what you had before, and then it would flip. As soon as you have a sense, again, I can imagine sort of having my sense. I can imagine being that rat, and all of a sudden I start moving a little bit. I can have a sense. Oh yeah, I have to flip. It's over there now. You know, that this is now the quickest way. Or no, that was the quickest way. And so very quickly you go from the quickest way is going this way to the quickest way is going that way, and it just flips on me. So it's that sense of like, what's the quickest direction to get to that movement to get me to that space? Anyway, I, I just think it's a different way of thinking about it, and it might be informative. Okay, so now the super tiny asked us to talk. I, we talked about the paper I want to write, and um, and then you and I had some time discussing some of the topics of that. And so I just want to I just want to go through that with super tiny here and be a little bit more explicit than we talked about before. Okay, so the whole goal here, and, and to all of our research completely, is about how to predict impact. <laughs> That that was our that's our whole uh, gestalt of how we we're figuring out how the near project works. So um, so we've come up all these different scenarios about predicting the input. So right now we're talking about sensory motor prediction. So to predict input requires knowing several things. We've talked about uh, it needs you need to know what the object is that you're that you're sensing. You need to know the location relative to the object that you're sensing. Uh, we know that you need to know the orientation relative to the object because that will change what you sense. Um, I've added, I, I've talked about this one, and I've talked about both things before, but I've never really sort of explicitly added them to this list. Okay, so now they're on this list, in my, in my uh, opinion. Are you going to, I'm surprised two and four seem redundant to each other. Um, they are, that's not, I'm, they're not to me, because it's, uh, you could think of it that way. I'm thinking of it more like I have a model of a coffee with this cup, and the location of the thing I'm going to sense is this part of the cup here. The model of the cup tells me I need to know the location of the cup. What I actually sense will depend on my distance from that. And if I, but I'm thinking the model itself does not incorporate that distance. The model itself is just in the reference frame of the cup. As opposed, so that's how I'm, I'm you could think of it the other way. You could say, oh, uh, if I say my relocation. So I'm assuming that there's a model that I'm using and this is relative to the model. This is, uh, and that's what, that's the thing I'm talking about. I'm, I'm doing this hole on the coffee cup or I'm touching this hole in the coffee cup, but what I actually, and that's the location on the coffee cup, but what I'm actually gonna sense is the distance from there as well. So I'm breaking it down a little bit further than that. Um, so, and I, that was a key thing for me. I mean, I did, this is a way of, um, I think that's part of what this exercise is about, is trying to really get at the core Definition of the problem. I, I've always said that the way to solve a problem is you define it better and better and better and better and better, and eventually your definition defines the answer. So I'm breaking this out, trying to be a little bit more explicit about it, and, and especially since I proposed a solution to that. And then we can't forget about the state of the object. And so my the camp, classic example I do for the, the stapler opening and closing, or the state of the cell phone screen. Right? You need to know if I'm going to predict what's on this location on the cell phone screen. I have to know what state the cell phone is. And this seems to be a bit open-ended. I don't know where to stop this. Like, like you know, what about color? You know, the chain, uh, the color I perceive in an object is going to be the uh, well, the actual input's going to vary depending on the the state of the, the world around me. And so I don't, there's a bunch of question marks here, like the tone of music. Like I'm going to predict an oboe if I've been hearing the oboe playing a song. I'm going to predict the next notes of the tone of the oboe. Um, that's not, a that's not part of the model of the song, but it's, it's like I'm combining a model of the oboe and a model of the song. So there's a bunch of other things here that, that we don't really understand. So that's, that's still a bit of a mystery here. But 
for no, for nothing else, I know for absolutely certain that I need to know incorporate state of the object as in like the, the app uh, the icons on the screen. Of this device. So then we have this assumption that this prediction is occurring in layer four. The papers they've all written about uh, say, oh yeah, there's input coming to layer four. That's where the prediction occurs. And Marcus and I, uh, we talked about this, and we talked about the different possibilities about how where is this where are these five where is this information arriving on layer four to make these predictions? So one of our classic examples of what we've been using in our papers, okay, there's this massive prediction from layer six, eight, or four. We've been assuming that's in the first uh, Tom's paper, that was the location, and now we, we know that's not sufficient. Um, um, there is, of course, layer four itself, which, which has connections, which we've talked about as learning sequences, but you pointed out last time, Marcus, that even the layer four cells could be subdivided into different groups. So maybe there's more than one population of cells here. And one way to think about that, by the way, is mini columns, because mini columns divide layer four in some sense. And, and we, 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 there's a mystery there. We don't quite understand all that. So there is structure in layer four that we only partially understand. Um, so I mentioned mini columns as a separate thing. There's a possibility that there are other layers projected into layer four. So 6A, typically people say that's 40 to 5% of the connections on layer four A cells. Layer four cells, there's a lot of local connections. But you know, if I if I bet you if I go look at that um, Human Brain Project uh, website, you know, I'll see a whole bunch of other cells get predicted too. So there's other things coming in here. We don't really know them. And then there's a possibility. Um, um, you know, we talked about the thalamus. There's something. You know, the thalamus is involved here too because we're not just getting unprocessed input from the sensor. We're getting something that's being processed from the sensor. And this is the this is the green. There are of course predictive signals or modifiers um, or modifying signals. Um, and so we have this circuit going on here. Um, and then there's another possibility that not all prediction has to occur in every column. So for example, I'm worried about like the color of something. Well, maybe that's their color is being predicted in some columns and the tone of the oboe is in other columns and the smell is in other columns. I don't know. So we have to be open to the possibility given the thousand brain theory that, there, that not all these predictions are, not everything we predict is happening in every column. So, I'm just trying to define the problem better uh, here. Um, and one of the reasons I've, I def, you know, I've sort of learned to, to break out the distance of the object is I now have a hy hypothesis that this is one of the things that the projection of 6A to the thalamus could be doing. Um, this is not a, these, this is this thing here, um, it doesn't really, it, it's nothing to do with the actual model of the object. It's more of a system level function. It's like, a, you know, it applies that the same. The solution here has nothing to do with the exact object I'm viewing. It's just how far away from the object. Whereas what I predict based on my orientation, what I predict based on my location, are all tied specifically to a model of the object. Um, this I could I could um, I can change this um, without really um, uh, changing knowing anything about it. Same thing could be said about orientation. I've also often argued that you know when I change my orientation, my thumb on this, I'm really not taking any advantage of. The, the orientation, I could calculate this independent of the object. As long as I know what the feature is, I can just rotate it independent of what the object is. So this is a very complex set of things here, but one of the things I'm thinking about is that, that, that you know, that we could be dealing with scale through the thalamus, um, and that would be both motor scale and sensory scale, and I could be basically uh, accomplishing the distance of the object or the scale of the object is really the same thing. So again, that would be the way of handling a small coffee cup and a big coffee cup. Um, scale there because um, I could have a you know objects of the same object slightly different sizes um, so um, I the, the point of this exercise here is is to move closer to having a fuller definition of the problem um, and so the extent that we can answer all these questions about exactly the things we need to know and where are the possible places that the information could be coming from is essentially the, the problem statement of uh, how you do sensory motor inference and learning um, in, our, in our system. So uh, this is just to share with Subutai uh, some of the things we talked about um, uh, last week. Um, and just, it's, it's almost like nothing new here, but it's good to say it again and put it down in writing again and maybe tweak the writing a bit. Um, um, and be very sort of explicit about all the unknowns we have. Um, so that's all I want to say about this topic.
Do you think each of those five things maps to specific layers? No, or, or I, I don't know. Combinations though, and that's I don't know that. Um, all I'm saying is these are requirements to predict. So the system to make it, we know the system can predict, and um, if it's going to predict, this information must be represented and handled somehow, whether it's learned uh, or whether it's a systemic um, process. Like learned would be okay, what specific feature is that some location of the object? Uh, a systemic process would be like, oh, change the scale. I don't need to know the specific features of change the scale. I can just that for every feature. Uh, but I, I'm trying. I, I, I'm, I'm saying these are the requirements. Here's what we think about the circuits we need, <laughs> uh, which is helpful to think about. Um, and then we go into all kinds of crazy ideas about exactly how this could map onto those requirements. You know, we've talked. Uh, we things we've talked about in the past. We have six B. We also have the whole idea that um, there's this other sensory input coming into layer, to a small portion of layer five. And I've talked in the past that that maybe is establishing um, uh, mini columns that, that that actually that's where it might be occurring. And then uh, Marcus and I talked about I brought up the idea that that. Actually, the mini comms themselves may be the reference vector that um, uh, that's talked about in this paper, and, and so now you have like you might you might think of things like this. You might say, "Oh, I have I have like a, a location grid cell location. I have a, an orientation set of orientation modules, and then I have a reference vector module, a reference vector, and somehow between those three things." Um, uh, I now have all the information I need to calculate all the stuff I need to know. So there's a, there's a, the way I like to solve these problems is you define these problems theoretically very, very cleanly, as deeply as you possibly can. And then you constrain yourself to these physical pieces and try to make them come together somehow. Um, and so as I think about this and when we talk about it, I think it's really important, and I've always said this, we have to understand exactly what mini columns are. We think we have one model of them. That model may be true, but it may be more than that. They may be actually, we think that they may be purely derived from, um, from sensory input, but perhaps that's not the case. And uh, perhaps they are um, actually just like, they may be changing as you do this kind of thing too, right? You know, it's, who knows? <laughs> it's weird. So I, I'm not gonna try, I, I think another thing that I'd like to do is I don't like to, um, settle on a solution too quickly. This is why sometimes I just like to state something and then go sleep on it for a couple of days. And I don't even try to think about it. It's the middle of the night I wake up and go, oh, there's another idea, there's another thing. Whatever. So, so the process here I'm trying to do is sort of state the problem again more precisely uh, and, and then state some of the possible solution elements um, and not try too hard yet to make an answer. If it, if it comes to us, great, but you can only way at it so much. <laughs> uh, and you just get depressed the entire time. I'm not depressed the entire time. Um, we also, just for completeness, we did talk about, um, did I have, let me have I mentioned that. Yet. Oh, another thing, another thing that this is just to review for you. <laughs> another thing we talked about is that, uh, okay, let's assume there's grid cells in the neocortex. Um, do all of our models and what most people think is in order to specify location, you need multiple grid cell modules. But when you look at a quarter of a column, we don't see anything that looks like multiple grid cell modules. <laughs> well, we don't see anything that looks like grid but, but think about it this way. There's like, um, well, it's just not clear. Um, and it's not, maybe not even enough cells in a quarter of a column to have multiple grid cell modules. And, and, when, and then when we looked at what the tank paper and he, he talked about a grid cell module. You listen to this, Mark Brown? You know, this hit with the this will interest you. These little um, uh, quadrants that are all basically multiple bumps representing the same thing moving around together. This was about the size of a, you know, a cortical column. Um, and so in the antiviral cortex, you've got something about the dimensions of a cortical column of the substantial size of a percentage of a uh, milk made in this dimension. And um, it was like four tenths of a millimeter or something like that in each dimension. So anyway, this this thing kind of occupied the space of like a cortical column, and and, uh, and so if you're going to have multiple ones, where would they be? In the interactive question, they have to be someplace else. And he did point out that some of these are more active than others, and so there's a, another coding that's going on there. 
So one poss another possibility is that we got the whole, um, the whole how you represent a unique location wrong. We've been assuming that there's multiple grid cell modules. And that when you look at the cells together, uh, you, you have a specific location. That's how our papers are written, that's how other people's papers are written. Um, but I think we have to be open to the idea that perhaps like layer 6B is a set of grid cell modules, but you really only get one. And how could that work? Um, there's obviously an additional coding going on in here. Um, uh, and, and then we talked about whether, you know, orientation could be similar, because like with this paper and what we've been thinking about, is orientation is basically, you can take a, a 1D orientation module with a 2D reference vector, and now you, get a, you can somehow create a 3D orientation. So the thought was, hey, can we take one, one um, 2D uh, Grissel module plus a reference vector and turn it into a, a 3D location? And one of the problems with that is, is I'm just saying all this to be complete, one of the problems with that is, um, is that uh, these things repeat. And so um, unlike a, a, an orientation cell, which is uh, closed, um, and therefore you don't have, a, you know, you don't have to represent very large, large number of orientations, here we have to represent a large number of locations, and unless I have multiple grid cell modules, it doesn't appear I can do that here, uh, unless I'm using something like this. But I have this, I have this, I, I think it's it's an intuition that's been gnawing at me for a long time that perhaps the way we think about location being multiple grid cell modules is not correct, and that there really may be just one of these with an additional coding on top of it, combined with some sort of reference vector that runs through the whole thing. Um, is somehow sufficient to do what we need to do. Because um, that's more what the anatomy looks like. It doesn't look like I have a whole bunch of these uh, grid cell modules lying side to side. So uh, we don't know yet. Marcus, you want to add anything? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this um, predict it, predicting input requires knowing these five things. Um, it's one okay. This, so this is relying on um, on there being some notion of like where am I sensing right now? Like what what part of the coffee cup am I sensing? Some yeah. notion of what's the current location. Uh, that is one way to do this. That might be right, but we, I don't think we've ruled out uh, the other approach that doesn't ever represent this. Uh, and the other approach is a little bit more inspired by uh, well, it's a little bit more similar to computer vision. I'll just put the copy cup in a like you know, basically a CAD file, and uh, and it, like, you, you basically know what I'm going to draw. Like no, you're I basically don't. representing <laughs> like what you said. Uh, you're ba you basically are using the location of the sensor in the reference frame of the of the object uh, and using this to predict uh, sensory input. Um, and I know you bring in the distance thing, and I'm about to incorporate that into. This. Well, I don't see the difference here yet. You're saying uh, that would be more there, uh, The location of the sensor in this reference frame, but I'm never ever drawing a box. I'm never saying like, and here's the part of the cup that I'm looking at. But but where is the definition of the cup? I mean, I have to have a definition of the cup, right? And the definition of the cup requires a reference frame. So where where am I storing the definition of the cup? Uh, so the the, na the naive, expensive way is to just take all of these locations relative to the cup and associate them with what you sense. Okay, and that's Locations pretty, that's variations. super, super expensive. Yeah, that's, that's the starting, that's the jumping off point. Okay, okay, uh, that's like the point I jump off and kill myself. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, now the the way to, like the solution is gonna look a lot like this with the distances and such uh, to make it practical is, um, okay, the, right now this is a 3D location and we want to convert it into Basically, why am I always having to draw spheres on this board? I need to learn how to yeah, draw spheres. Yeah, I, I, I still, still, don't, still don't quite get the distinction between those two. Like, location of the sensor versus location on, well, the, it's on not, the object. Yeah, there's that, but it's more like, well, where is the, you know, what, what is the definition of an object? It's very easy for me to understand the definition of an object if I say, oh, I put my cup in a 3D reference frame, and now at every point, at any point in that reference frame, I can say what feature is in. That's pretty easy. Um, but you're saying that's not what you're doing. You're saying here, I'm going to I'm going to learn a cup by what I sense from every point in the world. Yeah, which seems crazy, actually. I mean, so you, unless you got some magic trick to collapse it, yeah. um, that seems impossible. 
Uh, it's, it's just seems like I don't do that. It's, that would that would sort of imply that I have no ability to imagine what I would see from a different direction I've never been in before. Uh, like I'm going to look at the cup from a new orientation from someplace just from a different distance in a new orientation. I wouldn't be able to predict it because I haven't learned that, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, so, uh, I mean, really not clear the distinction. Uh, this is okay. The distinction is location of the look? sensor versus location on the sensed object. Right uh, now, uh, no, well, they're both there in both. They would both be there in both situations, so I'm not sure. I, so, yeah. right, col like columns plus and like the cosine poster and everything only represents where is this, and and where is it, and what is this orientation? Well, yeah, we, but we know that's not right. Well, we, we I mean, that, that could only work for finger. Yeah, that would not work for vision. It would work for vision. Well, but not not no, because it, no, it can because yeah, the location so of my eye is not what my cortical column is seeing. My cortical column is seeing this little location and point. orientation of the eye is is exactly is exactly the information you need to know what sensory right. input's coming into that cortical column. So, so you're basically saying there's no knowledge of a cup. Yeah. All you're saying is I have knowledge of of when I'm in the presence of a cup. If I can remember every single viewpoint I've ever had or might ever have, then I'd be able to recognize that this is a cup. But but you're saying there's no structure itself that's cup-like. Uh, I think. Yeah. Um, but that's a hard position to defend. Are you? I mean, theoretically, yes. But but do you actually believe it's possible? Because that seems like an impossibly difficult thing to learn, and and also that it wouldn't generalize at all. Okay. So yeah, it wouldn't generalize. Then. So the so then we solve that with child objects and composition. That solves half of this. The other half is solved. How does the child object solve half of it? Because then once you learn a bunch of child objects like cylinders or uh, or circles, uh, then you can compose objects out of those. Okay, so you're saying I still have to learn some objects this way. Yeah. But uh, not. A, but now, once I've learned some objects, I don't. I can now uh, infer the larger structure from looking at the sub objects. Yeah. Okay. So, so here I'm, here I'm focusing on the problem of 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 learning those child objects without having to view it from an uh, almost infinite number of locations. Mm. And are you saying if I see a completely new thing and I just look at it, then I close my eyes, I would not be able to visualize it from some other orientation? Uh, the the mechanism by which you do that is through comp through object composition. What if it's a completely weird thing that I've never then seen? Before? Then if you if you were not able to segment that into some sort of child objects, then no, you won't but be able to. Doesn't this, get into, that's, that's doesn't this also get into trouble as my compositions get more and more complex? So, for example, let's say I learned uh, what letters look like from every position in the world. Big task. I don't think I can do that. But boy, what am I trying to let me make the case for it? Okay. Right, okay. okay I'll let you make the case for it. Um, sure. Give me a few shots. So, like you, like we said, that's really implausible that you'd have to learn the the eyes. Uh, Learn what the sensory input on, uh, on the eye is from every location. The solution to that is yes, to factor in the distance. Uh, rather than having to learn uh, the it for every location of the eye, um, you learn it basically if you factor out the distance. You're you're essentially drawing a big sphere around around it, and now you just have to learn. I know I'm I'm drawing spheres again. <laughs> And and now now like an a, a dimension is factored out. Now you need to learn like what do I sense here? What do I sense here? What do I sense here? Uh, and it's still a lot. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's a fundamental computational problem. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, but so, all right, so no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a flaw. I'm saying like this is our brains do it somehow. Like, yeah. It, 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 well, it's the problem. Well, well, okay. So uh, it's theoretically possible, I suppose. But now if I think about the two possibilities. One is the model of the object. Completely independent. I never learn anything from a distance. Nothing. I never learn that. Uh, which, I, I, which I is also also true here. No, no, because I have to learn it at some sphere. My perfect sphere here. I have to learn it, and then you're going to adjust it all, right? Um, anyway, it just I, in in this case, I can't. I cannot. In, I cannot recognize these objects from new positions unless I've trained it on all these positions. Um, there's no. Uh, there's no generalization in this. Brute force learning method, I understand. For the child object. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, but that's that's pretty.
pretty hard to swallow it all in its own right. Yeah, and now you can factor out the distance, but it's still pretty hard to swallow because that's how we do that, but maybe. Um, but we, We've never gotten any form of desk work. I know, but I'm, that's what I'm trying to do here. So uh, that's what I, that's the whole point of this exercise, right? Um, and, um, but intuitively one feels like a model of something in a CAD model, for example, they, they don't do it this way. They do it, they do it, you know, like, like, okay, the, what's, the, what's the features relative to this, to each other, uh, not where, what do I observe relative to, to the object? Um, and I would argue that we're doing it the CAD way as well when we, when we learn what we're, what I agree, we are doing the CAD way. This is not the Cadway. This is the Cadway is, is this way. It's, uh, so the Cadway segments this into a bunch of child objects and figures out where those are. And the, but it's all everything is stored in the rep. There's no, there's no notion. When I want to take a view of the world and, and a cat card and says, "Oh, show me what this looks like from here," they there's no knowledge about what it looked like from any particular location. They take the model of the object. And then from that, they can derive what you would see from that distance. It's not like, oh, I remember seeing that from the distance, those child objects, and they build it up. It's not like, no, I can take this model and flip it around and turn it out and show it in any direction. And I can do all these things. So the fundamental nature of the model is the, is the relative relationships of these things to each other, not to where my, my sensor is. This, this is very fundamental to me. It's, it's, and I'm just saying, I'm, we accomplish all those things currently with displacements. And that's. Well, we don't, we're not there yet. We haven't done right, everything right. yet, but, but we are in, not in there. Our, in, our, in our skeleton model. That's how we were going out the approach we yeah. were taking. So I guess I want to understand something. Are you proposing that you really think this is something we need to investigate and keep tracking? Or are you just making the, the argument that we should think about I think it's, it's the more realistic approach. Really? The, the, this idea of knowing where on the coffee cup your eye is currently on, I, it's, it seems like a unnecessary intermediate step. Uh, uh, that's, that's, um, wow. I, I, well, it's surprising to hear you say that. I guess I, I need mean, to absorb that. Okay. I need so, to absorb that. Why do you think, uh, um, I guess the question of where is the camera in the CAD file right now seems like the fundamental thing to represent. No, a CAD file has no sense of a camera position. Never. It just never has a sense of a camera position. CAD file itself is the object. Sure. And then so the, the, at any point in time, in any variation, any time of twist and turn of the world, you can take that model and, and apply it to different places. I can change the color, I can change the view, I can change the shadow, I can change the orientation. But the model itself is completely independent of all those variables which change around it. And, and, and it's the fundamental nature of that model. Now, that doesn't mean that's the way the brain works. But certainly that's the way CAD files work. And, uh, and that's the way you would it's inherently most efficient to do this is to store the things that are relevant to the specific thing you're doing in the in the framework of the thing you're doing, independent of how you're sensing it, where you're sensing it. You know, another thing we do is, is we can look at an object, um, a new object, and then I can close your eyes and have you reach into a black box and you can identify which of that object you just saw. My knowledge about the models I extracted from vision applies to touch. And the knowledge from extracting touch applies to vision. If I go through a central CAD file representation, then that works. If I go through this kind of representation, I can't do that. I, I can't say, oh, yeah, well, you know, I've seen it from this, this special, you know, uh, sphere here, uh, but now I'm touching it here. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm having, I guess I'm trying to find out if you really believe, you're saying you really believe this is a more practical solution. It's the only one I know how to get. You, you can start to get to work. And it, and it involves, you have to combine this with some notion of compositionality. I got That's it. How you well, that. how do you solve my compositionality problem? Because in the compositionality problem, I said, yeah, okay, what if I could do some, some basic elements, which I think is hard to do, but let's say I could do some basic elements. And now I'm going to go composition to composition. As I have both compositions to compositions to compositions, this gets harder and harder and harder. So, for example, I've, I've started to say, like, okay, we got the coffee cup, and I got the letters on the logo. Now, maybe my elements are the letters on the logo. And so, okay, now I'm running a composition, which is the name Numenta. I don't I haven't learned what Numenta looks like from all angles. I only know the elements. And so for me to recognize Numenta, I have to look at each element in turn. N-U-M-E-N-T-A. I don't do that when I recognize Numenta. I recognize it as its own thing. It's its own primitive. 
So I mean, I then I have to learn the momentum from all these different angles. Now I'm going to learn the coffee cup with the event on it. I don't look at like, I don't say, oh, N U N E N T A dot line dot line dot line. Okay, that's my that's my coffee cup. I don't do that. I, I kind of create a new representation that's instantaneously recognizable um, without. So the, 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 this idea that you've got this composition of elements that you learn this way doesn't scale. It doesn't, it doesn't it won't let me get to complex objects because all I, the world would always be just like looking at lots of little things all the time trying to figure out what they are. Uh, and I don't do that. Once I've learned a coffee cup, I can just flash and find me, oh yeah, it's in a dimensional coffee cup. I don't understand any of the sub objects. Um, so how do you deal with that problem? So compositions of compositions. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is, okay. Um, Without having to learn everything, again, right? Right. It's okay, so you're saying because this, now this is just becoming brainstorming. But compositions of compositions isn't something I've okay. tried to work so, here. Look, I, I think I think your proposal here is is an interesting intellectual thought exercise that help might help us think about the problem better. The moment I'm totally unconvinced that this should be practical. Uh, I just just don't believe it at all. You're, you're going to have to really work on me to make me think that. I'm coming up with all these things as we're talking about it. I just, I don't know if you'll find other, do other computer vision systems try to figure this out? Or try I'll to figure, figure that out. out. Uh, try to figure out what point of the, op, of the object am I currently looking I, at? I, I don't think that's the right question. The right question is, what does the model of the object look like? If the model of the object, it, it, computer vision systems, every CAD system models objects as features at locations, independent of where the eventual lighting source will be, or the eventual camera will be, or the eventual anything will be. That that is the is the logical way of going about this, and um, so the camera position is not even part of the model of the object. It is an accepted step you can apply later, and so clearly you have to deal with that but it's not fundamental to any memory of the object. There's no memory of what the coffee cup looks at a particular eye distance. It's only what the coffee cup structure is. And then right. from that, I can infer everything else. So Somehow, though, the system has some set of primitives, some set of things that it knows what they look like from different angles, and then it makes objects out of those. Well, so you could say it knows what it looks like from different orientations, how what this, this feature feels like in different orientations, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have to uh, remember it from every position in the world. Uh, I, I've already given this examples where I can learn it from like they touch and then I can see it. It's, it's not, so I have to go from a specific sensory modality, which might be from a distance, and invert that into an object-centric model. And with that object-centric model, now I can infer or recognize from any other modality that has different types of features and different types of movements and so on. Um, it's really, really hard to imagine any kind of knowledge about this specific thing, about the model of the world being specifically dependent on the position um, that I've seen it in. Um, it's just, it's really hard to even imagine that could possibly be the case. I'm not saying, this is sort of, to me, this is the problem we have to solve from this. Um, that's how it feels to me. So, I mean, all talk about here is is really trying to deal with the problems we haven't really dealt with yet on the orientation and and, and it has to go with this distance so i've used the distance thing as sort of a um, um, a red herring in some that is in which i don't want to get sucked into i want to say how do i resolve that uh, but still keep my model the same and you're saying hey i'm going to embrace that and say that's part of my model i have trouble believing that one uh, but you know i'm not saying don't pursue that but you're going to have to come up with and explain because that's that is definitely the unusual way of thinking about it that's not how CAD plots work. So um, uh, I think if you, that it could be correct, but you'd have to address all those issues. If you're, if you have a bigger burden to make uh, make that case. That'd be my, my argument. Um, I'm trying to figure out, by, I'm trying to just, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how do I make this thing work? We haven't done it to work yet. Um, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to think, okay, how do I end up with a model of a cup that is independent of sensory position, independent of sensory modality, independent of everything? It's, um, it's just a model of a cup. And uh, yes, I can view it from different distances, and I will know my distance. I'm aware of my distance when I view it. Um, I know that that cup is further away or closer to me. I have a sense of that. Um, so it's it's not like oh, that's a cup, and I've learned it at this position. It's like yeah, I need to. It, it's like I don't. I can sense it any position. 
no preferred position. That's why, and that's why I'm so excited about the six data thousand thing, because I think this could really do that whole uh, distance computation. It just looks perfect for that. Um, yeah. Uh, and the same, you have to, if you're gonna do this thing, you too, too, it's not only, you have to also figure out how you're gonna handle the, the whole issue of, of movement relative to this thing. Um, uh, you know, like, how do I, yeah, you have to solve that problem too. So this, the, all of a sudden you're gonna start burdening everything with this com uh, combinatorial explosion problem. What do you mean movement relative? Um, like, um, let's say you're in the open stapler. Yeah. Yeah, how, how you make the motion and it can be oriented you know, any way with, with respect to you. I was also thinking like, uh, I'm moving my finger from uh, on my phone. I want to move my finger from, you know, the button on the bottom here to the, the button on the side. And um, um, or I want to see from here to here. I guess there's, it, it's a staple thing. It, it's just, basically there's movements related, there's this thing moves and there's my movements related to this. And it's easy, if, if I have like a, uh, imagine I have a map of a town, right? This is what I'm using the book. I got a map of a town. And from that map, I can figure out how to get from point A to point B. And it's um, um, the movement commands I need to do that. Um, I don't remember that from any specific location. It's like I could apply, it's like I, I can generically apply movements to, uh, I, I need to think about this. Um, but my, I have a sense, I'm sorry, I'll have to take, I, we'll take it back. I'm just saying, I have to, I'd have to think about it more. But there's so many things depend, there's so many things that depending on have a model that is independent of your position, independent of your sense, your particular sensor and independent of everything that, that it's hard for me to accept a model that doesn't have, that, that is, is, is not like that. That I think you're just going to run into problem after problem after problem. Like I, I talked about the, the compositionality uh, depth. Um, that's going to be a problem. Um, no, I don't know how to solve that one. But yeah. Otherwise, I feel like what I've said here is much more similar to what other people have said. Really? Like, cool. Like, um, the, um, oh, come on. What's his name? Uh, composition by uh, the components, recognition by components. Biederman? So, yeah, Biederman. Or, or, or going back further to Mar or. Oh, oh, so you're saying like, yeah. having these core. Well, remember, so, so right. this, is, this is a fundamental uh, thing in cognitive psychology for decades. People have argued both sides of this. Uh, okay, there's, so, there's evidence for. So first of all, this is this is a composition sides. of features too, right? Uh, they're both in some sense composition of features, but but those systems are totally insufficient for doing anything. They've never really gone anywhere, right? Um, those ideas have never gone anywhere because they just don't scale up. They're like like old vision ideas. It just doesn't scale. It doesn't solve enough problems. Um, it's and, and it doesn't deal with this complex compositionality problem. It's they were trying to figure out, oh, how do I recognize this as a cube? <laughs> That's as far as they got with those systems. You know, it, 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 I just use them as fundamentally limited. So just the fact that someone wrote about it, you know, fifty years ago. Um, that, those are very, very limited ideas. Um, okay, I bet you Supertai wants to get back to his work. Um, I, 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 would, I would bet a hundred, a thousand to one that the answer is not going to be like this, Marcus, but I could be wrong. So if you want to make a case, you've got to make a really, really strong case. To me, this seems intuitively so much fundamentally more uh, sound base to start with. And the fact that we haven't figured out exactly how to do this is not the reason to abandon it. It's the reason to focus on it and figure out what aspects of this we don't understand yet and, and how to address them. And, then, and that's exactly, you know, that's a perfect example of this in my philanic loop here to deal with the scale of both, of both time and space and motor. It, it's a beautiful solution to solve a lot of whole set of problems there and it matches the biology and it's like, oh, okay, that could possibly be happening. Um, so, and then the whole issue of, you know, making specific prediction based on orientation and so on. It's, uh, um, yeah. I'm not sure if you want to continue on the topic. It just... I'm feeling impatient for Subutai because I think he must have. <laughs> but I don't want to continue. Well, just one thing I really liked when Brains. my leap from thinking like this to thinking like this kind of came hand in hand with Thank you, Reed Shark, for the follow.
displacements uh, because now if you take the location of this in one reference frame and its location in another, you can take the displacement between them. Um, I still think that's but, possible. I, I think that's right. I should yeah. have, that, sorry, that was an aside to the main thing I was going to say. Okay, uh, can, I, can I just point out? Sure. Because I think we do this all the time. I think if I attend to you and then attend to Subutai, I automatically calculate the distance between you and Subutai. That's part of inherent, and that's like the space themselves. So I agree with that. But that doesn't define, that's not my model of the object. I don't say, oh, you two are this position apart when I'm here. Right? You are that distance apart, it doesn't matter where I am. I get the same displacement if I'm over there or here or there. That's, to me, the trick. Okay, so I'm agreeing with that, but I don't agree with your conclusion. The, the nice problem that I, um, that we can totally avoid having to solve if we, if we do do this approach is, as you saccade around, how do you perform 3D path integration? Like, how do you, how do you say, all right, I'm on the left corner. Now I'm moving forward in the cup space. Now I'm moving back in the cup space. Yeah. Uh, path integrating the third dimension is not, it, it seems to be necessary with this approach, uh, or you have to somehow account for it, where here that's not necessary. Here, saccading the eye just updates the eye's orientation. Yeah, but it intuitively feels like that 3D thing is what I'm doing. I, I have an intuitive sense that the gist is everything from it as I move around. If I look at this room, I'm not looking at a two-dimensional, I don't perceive a two-dimensional tableau of this room. I have, a, I have a very, very innate sense of the distance of everything from it. And so that's one of the key insights here that, that I've been working on is that that's part of every sensation. Every sensation, um, you, you have a sense of how far away it is. You can't avoid it. And, um, and so it's not like something I have to add. It's something that's there from the start. Um, and I have to explain how I got it. You know, that's, that's the trick. Now, it's obvious if I have a model of the room, it's 3D, and that helps, right? Because then I can even show you, um, I can show you a two-dimensional, um, you know, here's a two-dimensional picture that I see in this three dimensions. Um, and, and there's nothing three-dimensional about it. Um, but I perceive it as three-dimensional. That's That tells me the model in my head is three-dimensional. It's not like... It's not like, I don't think stairs are a set of these features relative to each position like this. No, there are a set of features that are in 3D relative to that. Uh, and I think what you're suggesting here is I would recognize that as a set of stairs because these are features in this arrangement, but I'd have no sense of its 3D structure. But I can't help but seeing that in 3D. It's, it's, there's no way I can see it other than in 3D. It's very, very hard to not see that in three dimensions. It's like it's hard to see not see this in three dimensions. Uh, or even this, we see this as a three-dimensional structure. So I think what you're suggesting is I don't, I wouldn't know that. I would have to see this as a 2D thing. And remember, that's a set of stairs because this is the arrangement of child objects in these positions. And now I have to learn in another position and another position. I almost, I almost feel like this example here, uh, Marcus, disproves your hypothesis. Just seeing a novel arrangement of, of I, 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 you made some leaps there. I didn't quite get it. Uh, so this is, this is sort of a generalization. How do you see a novel staircase? And Not even a novel staircase. I'm seeing a, an how, image, do I, how do I, how do I, this, this thing here, my option is three dimensional. That is, and, um, and I cannot see it otherwise. And if, and if all I were doing is saying staircases are a set of arrangements at some um, two dimensional displacements from each other, which is what this guy is doing. And then I have to learn it from another position like this guy. Right, like, like, it's like here, you're saying, I'm learning what this object looks like by moving my eye back and forth without knowing the depth of these features. Isn't that what you were just saying? I don't, I, you don't need to, you just said, I don't need to know the depth of these features to, for this to work. You just said, oh, I don't need to know that this is further away than this, because this, I can just look at feature, 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 feature in some sort of, you know, space like this, and I can figure out the displacements and so, I take this three-dimensional cup, I turn it into a projection of an image, like a two-dimensional right. image. So then you're figuring out, like, okay, now you're figuring out that, okay, I'm right here in the space of this ellipse, uh, and I'm, and you're figuring out I'm, I am, so this is this is one child object. You're figuring out your location in that space. Uh, another child object, it might be the handle. I'm figuring out where I am in that space. Uh, so you do know distances in that sense. 
and and now right, you're but the question is, now sorry the question about the dinging. Is, what is the model of the cup? Displacement. Well, in our is it three-dimensional displacement? Yes. Is, well, because you just started by saying a moment ago, the, the advantage of this, the second your approach is I don't need to know the depth of the the features on the cup. That's what you. That's what I was reacting to. You said I don't need to, the, the advantage was I don't need to know the depth of the features of the cup. I can just. Isn't that what you said? You don't have to. It, th that information is all there. It, um, this builds 3D models of coffee cups. This builds 3D models. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but only if so I, only if I have to learn the all the components. I have to learn all the components and only the components. Because you agree, there's a combinational combinatorial explosion pro, uh, problem if I have to learn every object from every position. Yeah. So I'm. I just think it's a. So it doesn't work. I can't do this, that. Okay. Can, can I try to articulate? I, I'm still not really sure what the distinction is here, but um, in in this bottom model, you're going to learn how a circle looks like from every distance, what the projection of a circle is onto the eye you from mean, every like, distance like the and every angle, top. and you'll have learned that for circles. Yeah, that's the and, super naive version that doesn't factor out distance. But yes, yes. Uh, but I okay, maybe. But that, that's yeah, what so you're far, so far, but you have to learn it at every distance. No, he's saying you don't have to learn every distance. You have to learn every single uh, position on the sphere. Because he's you can subtract out distance the same way I'm trying to subtract out distance. So you can say you have to learn circles from every single orientation, but not from every single distance. Because later we can zoom in and zoom out. Type of thing. Okay. Which so you're still, still so, so you're you're, you're still a huge. You're still a lot. You're factoring out one dimension yeah. or a couple of yeah uh, one dimension of it, but you still have to learn it from every every angle. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you have to do that for every component, every every common. There's there's some set of things that you have to learn that yeah. the projection onto the eye from every possible angle. Yeah. And then once you have that, now you can create three D compositions of that. Yeah. And but you so you're representing the relative positions of these um, sub objects or whatever that you've learned. But so that that is you, there. you you have reference from each frames for each one yeah. and you're learning relative 3D positions of each one. Yes. That seems to me the only difference is what we're calling an object uh, or a feature. Here in, in the top one, you would still need to learn you know, how, how a thing, how something feels or uh, what the sensation of every point on an object is from every location. I, I really don't see the distinction between the mm -hmm. In, you still have three D reference frames, and three, this is not. Um, I mean, you, st you still have three D reference frames, and you still need to do transformations and all that stuff in the bottom model, right? Yes. So, what is what is the distinction? Is it just that the scale of the thing that you know at every orientation? Because here, also, I mean, you have to know what this feels like at every orientation. Here, you're saying we, what we know, what we memorize, is this thing at every orientation. Is that the only difference? You see my point? Or yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I don't actually see the difference between them. Uh, it's hard for me to compare them because I mean this this is column plus scaled up with the uh, with displacements added and then with distance factored out. There's a lot of unknowns here. I can't. I can't compare. Right, but somebody's right. asking, what is the fundamental difference between these two? I keep coming back to. I want to understand what is the model of the object. That to me, that's the important part. You know, how do I represent this structure? And is there a fundamental difference in representing the structure? Uh, what, what 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 sends me off is when you say I have to remember this. What this thing looks like from every different position in the world. It's like, wow, well, I can't do that. That seems wrong to me. Um, but point civilized point is well, even with my finger, I have to sort of learn what an edge feels like in every single position. Um, yeah, and that's no difference than my eye learning how a, a point is from every different orientation. If there's no distance uh, factor to it, then just exactly the same as the finger. Yeah, and, I guess and maybe also, I mean, here you have a three D model of things. You still have to do do occlusions, and so you have to have a model of how one sub object occludes the other sub object. So you need. I'm assuming you're not 
saying you're going to learn that every single possible occlusion thing in advance, that there's going to be some model of how objects occlude one another. Right. So that's, again, more similar to the CAD model. Um, so I'm, I'm really not just a matter of scale. Of well, no, I think I've brought up two fundamental issues here that are, I think are different, but maybe I'm wrong. One fundamental issue is the, the, the depth of compositionality of the book, right? So um, I think that would work here too. Uh, I mean, I, I, because I don't see really the well, distinction the, 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 I think they were, because you're still representing the relative uh, reference frames of these two sub objects. And now you can do that again and again and again. It doesn't for good loop. Something that stops you. But it seems like if I, when I look at a very complex object, it doesn't feel to me like I'm I'm saying, oh, there's a whole bunch of little sub objects here. It's like the coffee the logo becomes its own sub object. And then the coffee cup becomes its own sub object. And so I can incorporate um, a coffee cup into the model of this room if the coffee cup was glued to the table some spot and I don't have to I don't I think it's the same here it's just really? that at some point it can't be turtles all the way down at some point there has to be something that you memorize right? um, uh, you know whether it's an edge or a circle whatever it is at some point there at the lowest level there has to be something you Okay, so the other yeah, thing, I, I, I'm not sure I agree with that, but maybe. Then the other thing I said is I have to be able to go between modalities. So I have to have a, some sort of model of a coffee cup that allows me to learn it through one sensory modality and then uh, recognize it through a different sensory modality. Um, and, and so anything that requires um, specific knowledge about if I want to represent that cup, I have to have it. Somehow it has to be in a, a modality, it has to be in a form that is not tied specifically to the particular sense. Um, so I'm not sure, it seems like we suggest. For that, I've always really liked the idea of using a union of displacements to pass along a compositional object from one modality to another. Me too. Uh, that, uh, I mean, but that's not going to work. Maybe I'm, I, I, can, I can sense, I can predict how that's going to feel. It's not just displacements. I can. I can look at something and predict how. It's right. So, here. so is, the, is if both modalities have learned a common set of child objects. Yes, that's would then, be the, then it can work. Yeah. That, that's so you would have learned how that thing, not only how it looks at everything at, at every orientation, but how it feels at every yeah. orientation, and you've made that mapping somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. but yeah. once you've done all of that, you still need all of the machinery you need for doing that. How is it? How is it? And you that still I, need all of the relative positions of things and occlusions and how things are going to, how these sub objects are going to rotate and um, uh, uh, you know how the, the, the entire object as a whole is going to rotate from different viewpoints uh, you need you still need to solve all of those problems it's the same set of problems there I don't see it's just a question of what we call the feature or the lowest level thing maybe you know, maybe I'm too harsh, uh, Marcus, but the way, the way you describe this, I have to learn something from every position, every information. I'm like, I can't do that. Um, and I can't do that for, and I can't also rely, uh, and maybe I got this wrong. Maybe I don't have to do that for a very complex object. But, but somehow when I look at a very complex object, I don't attend to all the little teeny little things and figure out, you know, I, don't, I don't rebuild that kind of initial structure every time I, I see something. Right. I, I see what you're saying with like, for example, the new Mento logo. It's not like it's not like your child objects are N and U and M. Then you you recognize the child object and then uh, recognize another child object, recognize another one. Then I don't know. Maybe that is how it works. But, but, I, but I, that's I, that's I see why that's it. unappealing. That's how you definitely learn it. Sure. But I see why that's unappealing. That that's how you recognize everything is by breaking it down to its smallest. Yeah. Uh, these type these very like ellipses like very these yeah. very silly. Uh, I see the. Why that's not appealing. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that. So, I mean, this is a good conversation because maybe these things are closer than I, inter I interpreted them as. Um, that's super that point. Um, um, yeah, I mean, in the sense that you were saying, like, yeah, you see the edge of the coffee cup uh, and now you can predict what it's going to look like from other angles. I would, we're doing this. I see the no, I don't see the and, and, and even more, but, uh, if you take a handle, I suppose you have a, a cup without a handle. Yeah. And you tell me put a handle at this angle on the coffee cup, I can tell you exactly what that combination will look like and what would be occluded from every angle. 
Um, and you know, I've not learned that in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to have some model of how this transformations and occlusions and stuff work in order to do that for any combination. Here's another way. Like, here's another way to think about it. Like, think about we learn words, right? So a child is learning the words, and so the same with the learning three letter words. And the way they learn them is they go letter, letter, letter. That spells sense. Letter, letter, letter. And for a while, the child says, "Oh, dog, D O G," right? Um, and when they see the word, they, they go, oh, D-O-G, dog. But very quickly, they don't do that anymore. Very quickly, dog is its own thing. And you just see, I, I see entire phrases, and I recognize a phrase. And I don't have to even see, the, and I won't even notice that the letters are wrong. I just recognize a phrase. And that's why we skip, that's why we miss typos, because we just see the entire phrase, and we don't even look at the components. So it, somehow we have to accommodate that. Somehow we have to say, yeah, the world just keeps, I can't, and become the, the new elements become complex, even though I learned them this way. I learned them piece by piece by piece. That's how I agree. That's how we learn. That's the whole displacement idea. I like that. That's how we learn. But somehow, then we got to get beyond that. Um, we don't. We can't. We don't go around the world reading, you know, text. You know, we don't go around reading Shakespeare by letter by letter. Um, uh, it just all comes together somehow. So I don't know. I, I just these are sort of throwing out ideas that somehow we have to, I think what you're proposing is not completely wrong, but I think it just doesn't, I don't see how it gets me to that next level of, uh, of um, I don't know, what I just described there. So the, the new elements become very complex. Yeah. So somehow we have to accommodate that. I thought, you know, our, um, Our voting mechanisms to sort of achieve that. If you think about it, a bunch of columns in the cortex, and I could I can attend a letter by letter by letter. A column might be saying, "Oh, here's a letter this, and a letter this." And letter, and that sequence is dog, right? Now you have a whole bunch of columns, and each one is sort of you know now they now they the the, the the recognition of dog on its own is that the columns next to each other are uh, somehow voting on the I'm making this up voting on the entire. Thing. Like I'm seeing a D, you're seeing a G, I'm seeing an O, but somehow together we know that that's dog. Um, that, that kind of we don't do that in voting, but that could be with you know voting could have this uh, spatial aspect to it too. So it could be a second learning step that I have to accommodate. So I can learn it once as a sequence, sensory motor sequence, and then but later I have to be able to recognize it completely. Uh, so I, I, I'm just pointing out that voting might be the way of uh, bridging between. Brains. Uh, complex elements, something like that. I don't know, because I'm going to have to accommodate that. So I think the, the, the good thing about this the conversation today is we're trying to see if we can move these two viewpoints into the same position, um, that they're really two flavors of the same idea, um, and that they're really not, as soon as I point out, maybe they're really not that different at all. Um, I just two perspectives. Um, but then the, the ultimate solution is to come in both. Would that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anything else? Okay. Head out. All right. You want to keep talking, Marcus? Are we done? Uh, I don't have anything else, but it's um, yeah, yeah. All right. I'll think about okay. it some more. Thanks, Nick Nil, for the follow. Uh, okay, I'm going to get a better close up view of the whiteboard before you leave. Okay. You're going to do that under uh, bubble? Yep, I can. There we go. That one looks like 31 sailors today. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure what it is. And you're down, so I not on that. Okay, when you turn the meeting off, I'll, I'm going to exit go to meeting now, I think. And I'll turn my okay. audio on. Uh, yeah. Alright. Okay. So this top bit was an interesting part, and I can't see it very well. Yeah, that'd be great. What do you want to see? Um, that the sort of the top right part. Okay.
I think I saw this stuff pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Can't turn and here we go. Okay. Uh, do you want to carry the double back, Jeff? Sure, thank you. All right. I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn the volume off on it. So. All right. Thanks. All right. So. Let me make sure. <clears throat> uh, let me catch up on chat here. Um, so I didn't, wasn't even planning on doing that research meeting. It just popped up. So we did that. Uh, so Zeltran is saying studying the Hydra is cool because you can see all their neurons as they fire in real time. That would be very cool. <laughs> um, and uh, Nick Nil, yeah, thank you for the follow. Um, uh, Pi235 posted on the forum a few days ago. Yeah, I, I remember seeing something about that. Yeah, we, we don't do that for sure. We're we're interested in, in sort of unlocking the secrets of intelligence at a high level. And I know there's a lot of stuff you can learn from lower level organisms, but um, uh, we're focused on, the, you have to focus on something, you know, if you, we're focused on specifically this thing. <laughs> and even more specifically, I think the, the neocortex and then and the bits directly underneath it, you know, sort of in the object representation thing. Hippocampus, central rhino cortex, thalamus is really our area of research. How does that stuff work? How does that stuff create models of reality based upon the movement of your sensors through space? Um, so glad you enjoy the research meetings, Jeremy. Um, I gifted you a subscription and I gifted Mark Brown a subscription because you guys keep coming back. So I'll, I'll keep doing that. If you guys keep coming back, I'll, I'll gift out subscriptions so you don't have to watch the ads. Um, how many research staff? Just a few right now. But I mean, you saw them in the meeting pretty much. Uh, we do have, uh, we have interns coming and going all the time. We currently don't have any interns. We usually have like two or three. So there's in, always intern opportunities. Um, you can look at nementa.com if you're interested in that, slash careers, I think. Um, and I think we are hiring a machine learning engineer right now. Um, and you can look at our website about that. I think that's posted as well. Um, I'm gonna context switch 